Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture 19, May 24th. I hope you had a great weekend. Today we'll be talking about nearest neighbor search and large language model. So as always, I'll start, start with an, a few announcements and we'll do a brief recap about document retrieval. Remember that in last class we were <laughs> We actually did the document retrieval and did the open domain QA tutorial. And we're coming back to retrieval a bit because I thought that you might want to know these before you work on your final project. So that will be largely until here. This will be about nearest neighbor search. And then we'll move towards large language models especially after BERT. And we're going to go through each paper and see what has been changed since BERT, what has been proposed in the paper that actually is different from BERT, so that we know how the, um, the research has been progressed, has progressed since BERT in chronological order. <clears throat> Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for the, um, the, I have a bad throat today. A lot of meetings. Okay, so a few announcements. So actually we have a really important annou announcements today. Number one is that um, assignment four is due on this Friday. I told you that this is quite easy and actually um, one of the students pointed out that, um, that the points do not add up to 100, excluding the bonus points. It was true, so I added one easy problem. And it's very easy. It will take like, I think like 10 seconds to do it. So please make sure to do it. I mean, but I don't think I will deduct, you know, uh, 10 points, even if you haven't um, answered this problem and you already submitted, but yeah, please make sure though. Yeah, why not? <clears throat> um, and then final project. I told you this in the last class too, but please make sure to attach the email or chat to the final project as the proof of my, uh, I mean, as the proof of my approval, if you're working on your own project. So this is corresponding to option two in the final project. And I highly encourage you to actually select option two if you're working on NLP related project, because I really think that it's not a good idea to work on several projects at once. So, but if it's not related to NLP, I mean, sorry, but that's really hard for me to make it NLP project, right? So, um, but if it's related, I, I think I, ha I haven't, I haven't said that you, you cannot work on that for anyone up to now. So probably means that I'm pretty open to various projects, right? So um, please don't be shy asking. Although I think I told you that this is deadline is last Friday, but um, I'll just accept the, your email until uh, on Wednesday, until Wednesday. So please do that if you haven't done already. And then there is a change in grading policy. I'll become more lenient largely because I think um, the scores are lower than I expected. So I don't want you to get like, I don't want everyone to get like C and fail the class. It's the least thing I want to. So what I'm gonna do is that the final project and participation are the same, but the difference now is that each assignment is worth 20%. Of course, if you multiply that by four, then it will be 80%, not 60. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna allow you to drop the lowest lowest assignment, not adding them up though. So um, it's not like you, you'll be able to add them up, but I'll drop one of them so that if you missed one assignment or if you're sure that you did really well on the three assignments, then you might want to just not choose not to do one of the assignments too, right? Um, so I think that can be beneficial for everyone. And um, I'm going to release 
assignment one and two grades by this Friday. I'm really sorry for the delay. Okay. Any questions? Okay, hopefully everything is clear. Let's start with recap. So I think you remember this slide from last lecture that you have Wikipedia and let's say you have a question and you want to retrieve the document that's related to the question. How can we do that? The the most convenient way and most efficient way is that to map each document to a vector so that you can just compare between these vectors and find the, the document that has the, the, the most similar vector to the query vector. So this is called nearest neighbor search. And we talk about document retrieval, but of course you can retrieve literally anything. You can retrieve images if you can embed image and also you can embed your query to the same vector space. So it really depends on your application, but you can retrieve anything, not just documents. And of course you can retrieve not documents, but more fine grained level such as paragraphs or sentences or words. And we also discussed what's the difference between dense and sparse retrieval or dense vectors and sparse vectors. We discussed that sparse vectors are very useful if you want to find documents that ha have exactly the words that you're looking for, because sparse vectors are mostly bag of words based and one dimension, each vector corresponds to one word in the vocab space. Of course, if you do this way, then the vector size will be very big because it will be equivalent to the vector, the vocab size at the least. And sometimes you have uh, some n-gram, like bigram or trigram models, in th which case you can have your vector size to be very large, like a couple millions or even billions. For instance, Google search engine uses a lot of sparse vectors, sparse retrieval. And it is, it's, it is quite, I think everyone believes that it, the dimension can be as large as like billions or even like sometimes, you know, more than that. So that's a good thing, but sparse vector has a very bad, uh, very big disadvantage that it, you cannot compare between similar words. For instance, if you want to compare between good and best, maybe you intended that those two words to be mean about the same, but they are different words. They will occupy different dimension in the vector. So it is impossible to compare between those two. So it's very bad at finding uh, lexically different, but syntactically or semantically similar language sentence or words. Dense vectors have exactly the, the opposite advantage and disadvantage. So the advantage is that they can do this. They can actually encode syntactic and semantic information that can compare between words that have different uh, surface forms, but similar meanings. But the, the, the critical problem is that, not critical, but the relatively bad thing about dense vector is that it's really difficult to encode precise lexical information. And also another important disadvantage of dense vector is that sparse vectors are sparse. So you can create things like inverted index, which we'll see soon, but dense vectors are not sometimes easy to scale up and be accurate as well. So we'll actually discuss this because you're talking about millions and billions of vectors and you're searching through these so many vectors, but users or the applications often have requirement of less than like 0.1 seconds of retrieval time. So how can we do that? That's really the uh, big question that we want to answer in the first half of today's class. But before that, just a quick recap again. So we talk about one example of sparse retrieval, which is TFIDF. And I think remember that 
that this is term frequency. So you're computing how many times a certain term occurs in a document and you are counting the entire document word count. So this is something like 0.2, which means that 20% of words in D is T. IDF is inverse document frequency and and basically they're what they're trying to compute is that n is the number of documents and you're computing how many documents have the term t so this will be one if if t is everywhere what if, what if this is one, then this becomes one. So log of one becomes zero. That means TFI dev score will be, score will be zero. So it will be very low weight. So if a term occurs a lot, then its importance is very low. It's information theoretic point of view, right? Um, if you have a lot of, uh, you have really common information, then probably that, that information's value is not high. But that information's value is high if the term is very, infrequent or very rare. So that's what you're trying to compute and you're taking logs. So even if this is very big, how big this, this can be? You can have just one document that has this term, then it will be N, then IDF will be always less than or equal to log of N. And here, that means then um, it's at least like not super big number because you're taking log so that you don't have like a, you know, billions of uh, weights that are up to like billions. So then now you multiply these two to obtain the TFIDF of a certain term in a document given the entire document corpus D. And this is a vector, right? Because you have a, you have a value for its term T and you will have a value for every term in the vocab. So then if your vocab size is 10,000, then you can have a 10,000 values for 10,000 terms. And then you basically just put these values in the vector so that you can have a one, one TFI def vector. So TFI def vector, of course, is dependent on DN big D, not T. That's the important thing too. So, why then do we need to care about nearest neighbor search? It's because we are sometimes searching through billions, millions, billions, or sometimes even trillions of vectors. And you want to find the vector that is closest to your query vector. And you need to be really fast because most applications actually want it to be fast, apparently. Imagine that you're searching your query on Google and it takes like 30 minutes, then no one's gonna use it. It has to be, be, be up below one second, the entire search engine experience. <clears throat> and also you want to make sure that your accuracy doesn't go down much because if it does, then of course, again, it's not useful. So you have to, control the trade-off between these two. And it's also important to be knowledgeable of several similarity measures. You're pretty familiar with L2, which is also called Euclidean distance, which is just, what is it? Basically just computing the distance in the, in vector demand, in the, the, in the canonical sense, right? When you're trying to compute distance, what you do is you basically just um, first, you have two vectors, for instance, X and Y. And what you do is you compute the dist, com you, you minus X from, you minus Y from X. This will be still a vector. And then you basically just compute the L2 norm of it. So you might ask again, what is L2 norm? It's just square root of, first dimension of x1 minus second, first dimension y1 square plus dot, dot, dot. 
the last dimension of x dx and last dimension of y square. This is L2 norm. So that's L2 distance. You, now you get why it's called L2 distance and L2 norm because this thing is basically square rooting and then doing the norm thing is L2. And you also have um, L1 distance. You might be familiar with this from the L1 regularization, which is very known for sparse regularization because it actually encourages sparse weights. And it's also denoted as x minus y1. One. one is for the L1. And how you do this, it's very simple. You'd compute the absolute value. of x1 minus x2, no, not x2, sorry. Yep. x1 minus y1 absolute plus dot 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 xd minus yd. So this is the L1, L1 distance. And it's also called actually Manhattan distance because what this is trying to do is it's trying to compute the distance if you can only move in the axis direction. Why is Manhattan? Because Manhattan has like, just like the Seoul Gangnam, right? It has a grid squares. So if you want to go from here to here, your distance is not Euclidean distance, but your distance is actually this, right? So it's, that's why it's Manhattan distance. And um, in that case, then this will be um, y2 minus x2, and this will be x1 minus, no, y, I'm sorry. Like, you get the point, right? Um, it's a bit confusing, but this will be x2 minus y2, and this will be x1 minus y1. And you just add that, that's your distance. So it's L1 distance. And we have inner products and it's important to note that these two are metric, mathematical definition metric. So there is a very um, important characteristics that metric requires. And one of them actually is the fact that it should be bounded and also um, if something is similar, then it has to have distance of zero, right? If they are very similar, then it has to have a distance of zero. You can think of like that. I would encourage you to take a look at the Wikipedia metric definition if you're interested in what metric definition is. Um, but we don't really have to go into that. But I, what I want to say is that this is not metric. And how about cosine distance then? Cosine distance is simply um, you take the inner product of two vectors, shall use same notations to avoid confusion. And you divide that by the norm. And when you just say norm, it's usually L2, by the way. And so this dot product is, um, XTY, yeah, that's probably a better way to write it. And inner product is just XTY. Actually, to be more exact, cosine distance is always less than one. So when you say distance, you actually have to say one minus this. And you can just say this is similarity instead. Because similarity is something that's high if you are more similar. The distance is high if you are less similar, right? So, so what I want to say here is that cosine distance is actually metric too. It's really um, easy to prove it, but inner product is not. So now you get the problem because if it's a metric, 
there are a lot of properties that will not hold. Hold. <clears throat> hold. We'll get to that soon. But um, so, but you need to think of them a bit differently. How do they relate to each other? So, actually, I'll devote one. It's really actually. It's not really um, super important thing, but it's more of a detail, but it's good to know. Um, so how do they differ? Actually, it's also quite related. So what is distance between X and Y, L2 distance? So um, L2 distance is basically, you are, what you're trying to do is transpose X minus Y, right? So if you actually compute this, this is simply minus 2xty plus xtx plus, no, not plus, I'm sorry, minus. So what is this? It's just adding the two norms, right? And I put the minus at the front because L2 is the lower the better and distance is the higher the and L2 is lower the better, but then inner product is higher the better. So you actually have to convert, um, if you want to convert this to um, inner product can be converted to L2 like thing if you just do, um, or I'll convert L2 into more of a inner product like thing. So basically then this is, you're just putting the negative one half at the front and you just have x t y minus. Oh, I'm sorry, not negative half, negative two. The average of the two norms. Isn't that interesting? So the relationship between inner product and L2 is quite astounding because this is useless, right? This is like useless. This, you don't have to worry about that. The coefficient two is not really super important. What's really important is because when you're trying to find the argmax of this, so the coefficient at the top at the front is irrelevant at all. So what really trying to do is then the inner, the different, the only difference between inner product and L2 distance is whether you have this this, um, what, what should we call it? this, um, this, the uh, offset after you compute inner product. Intuitively, this makes sense because even if you have a really, um, so you have, suppose that X, X and Y have a high inner product, but they have a very high distance too. Then what that means is then they have high inner product but maybe one of them has super high uh, L2 norm or uh, vector length that this became too high. In that case, then um, this will be, the, the minus will be high, so the number will be low. So it makes sense because if X or Y is too big compared to the other, that means probably even if they are, they're in the same direction, they'll probably have a high distance between them. So that's why, uh, distance will be still non-zero and very high. So that's like a core difference between L2 and inner product. So uh, we, we're gonna come back to this, but uh, which one do we use most? What do you think? So traditionally actually L2 and cosine distance were mostly used, especially cosine distance was very popular because cosine distance allows you to um, actually, what do you call? Um, cosine distance allows you to normalize. I mean, it doesn't really care about the the magnitude of x or y. It just cares about the, the, the direction, right? So it's very convenient for TFI, DF, and etc. But in practice, it seems like for NLP domain, inner product works the best compared to L2 or cosine distance. Cosine distance doesn't really work well because it loses, the, it loses the magnitude. L2 is not too bad, but doesn't seem to have any benefit over inner product. L2, I think is relatively working well in maybe vision domain, but I haven't seen much 
applications where deep neural network based nearest neighbor search works better in L2 than inner product. So uh, if you are in doubt, I think inner product is the way to go, how you compute the distance between um, two vectors. And if you do inner product, the good thing is that the higher, the better. So you can just think of this as a logit in many cases when you're training. Okay, next is the, um, how we can do, oh, and I, I forgot to mention. So when you do inner product, we usually call MIPS, M-I-P-S, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to compute the maximum inner, inner product search. And it's actually a bit um, bad terminology to say that MIPS is also NNS because, because inner product is not metric. So technically there is no such thing as nearest neighbor because you cannot, it's MIPS is not distance metric, but you know, we all get the point, right? We, well, everyone knows what that means. So one of the benefits for sparse vectors is that if you're using MIPS for sparse vectors, not nearest neighbor, and this is also worth noting. So I told you that, Cosine distance is a metric, but then cosine distance has this term on the top, right? So cosine similarity is very similar to inner product, except that it gets normalized. So it is important to note that if you can use MIPS, then you can use cosine distance too. So you have, if you, because it's very easy, right? You can just normalize your vectors and then it becomes automatically cosine distance or cosine similarity. So, um, so that's why the actually TFIDF was very popular with the cosine distance or inner product based instead of L2 because sparse vectors can benefit a lot from the um, cosine distance. No, I mean, a lot from this uh, inverted index. So what is inverted index? So the point of inverted index is that you can make MIPS very efficient for sparse vectors. So suppose you can consider a vocab size of 10 million and we can reach 10 million very easily if you're using bigrams or trigrams, then it will be, it'll be even larger. And suppose that your query has two tokens and we're excluding stop words like is, are, to, these um, common non-meaningful words, syntactic words to be more exact. And if there are only a few documents that has each of the two tokens, then we can store these sets offline and just compute similarity among the two sets. So what does that mean? Suppose that your query Vector is something like a lot of zeros and you have one here and zeros. Instead of um, searching through every document and trying to compute the inner product, you can just, because you have only one or uh, two ones, right? You have two ones. You can just, if let's say your document one You have like a lot of documents, like millions of documents. Then what you really need to, you, you don't have to search through everything. What you have to search through is only those documents that have these dimension and these dimension non-zero, right? Because other dimensions will be zero. I mean, other dimensions of Q is zero. So the inner product will be zero anyways, whatever the document score of that is. So you can never get non-zero score for those documents don't have ones on these dimensions. Then you can just store documents that have non-zeros in this dimension. So in that case, then you have uh, some uh, inverted index I that corresponds to say, this is dimension is like 17. 
and this is like 102 too, then you're saying that we have a, this dictionary I and this dictionary I, 17th key of the dictionary contains a list of document IDs where it contains the non-zero dimension in that 17th dimension, non-zero value in 17th dimension. So something like 12, 1005, 1020, etc. You can just enumerate this for every I, where the I is the, I can be as big as the size of the vector or the vocab. Then when you are searching through, when you're trying to find nearest neighbor, you just have to access I-17 and I-112. And you'll have only a few documents that corresponds that are in this these two lists and then just do the exact search. You can be really fast, even if you have a lot of documents to search through. But what's the really important condition for this to work? The fact that documents have to be spread out and also the vector should be enough, sparse enough. Of course, the query will be really sparse because query are, queries are usually short, but documents may not be short. They might be really long, so they may have like 10,000, 100,000 words. So in many cases, you might have a very long list of documents that corresponds to I of some dimension. But still, um, for many practical applications, if you just remove stop words, and now you get why you have to remove stop words, because if that word is in, inside every document, then that list will be anyway the entire document. So why even store another list of documents like that if it's going to be just entire search space? So you have to only store those words that are not common enough so that you can be pretty efficient with this inverted index. So this is called index, this is index, right? So that, that's why it's called inverted index. And it's storing, it's inverted because you're, you're mapping from the vector dimension to document ID, not the other way. So the, the non-inverted for direction index will be from um, the, the document ID to vector dimension, but then this index will be um, the vector dimension to documents, document IDs. But of course, this won't work if you're using L2 instead of inner product, because even if your query dimension is zero, it matters what is on that dimension in each document, right? Because your distance will change, unlike inner product. So that's the really the beauty and the, the efficiency of inner product, that inner product allows you to ignore a lot of things safely. So I think I wrote everything I need to write here on the previous page. So in, the inverted index itself is not um, approximation. It can be exact and very fast. If you have a very rare words, it can be super fast, almost um, time complexity of one. But in general, exact search will be very slow. And it is linear in the number of instances, especially if you're dealing with dense vectors or if you're dealing with L2 distance. And because we're dealing with billions of documents, if not trillions, it's really hard to make the search really fast with the linear time algorithm. And the Therefore, we really have to think about how we can make this fast by sacrificing something. And unfortunately, there is a very smooth empirical and somewhat theoretical trade-off between the speed and the accuracy by approximating nearest neighbor search. And I said um, it's somewhat theoretical because um, 
I think this happens a lot. So nearest neighbor search has nice theoretical properties. For instance, um, it might have uh, some guarantees that is sublinear time. But in practice, these things are really meaningless because you can be more faster than these empirical guarantees a lot. Um, and still, no, I mean, to be the other way, actually, you can actually be more accurate than this empirical and theoretical guarantees a lot by a lot. So the theory and the empirical, um, empir the, the empirical results are have a, a lot of gaps. And there are some some methods that don't have a lot of theoretical guarantees, but are very fast and very accurate. So people use that instead. For instance, it's not um, not just in the approximate NNS, but if you are doing even TF-IDF and BM25, if you look at the BM25 equation, it's super complex. So no one gets why, why those numbers are there. And it's not a theoretical thing. It's more of an empirical evidence that it's really working well. And that's what people found. So, so just keep that in mind because I think both research is important, but then if your focus is on empirical, then keep in mind that the theoretical guarantees will not be as good as you expect. So just sometimes don't worry about it. But it's still, it's very interesting mathematical problems if you're interested, because um, it has really nice, interesting theoretical guarantees. If, you're, if you want to know more about, more about these, then you can take a look at the um, LSH and ALSH papers. So how can we then do NNS? So I think there are largely also two ideas these days that are prevalent and also very um, works well. So number one is that you just create a few buckets and put nearby points to the same bucket. So in fact, this is very similar to um, the inverted index because you can think of these buckets are the inverted index, but unlike the inverted index where you had the predefined mapping, very straightforward mapping, you know where to map your each document to because it, you just have to find out if certain term is in the document or not. But if you want to operate in general space, then you cannot apply the same thing. So you have to have some hashing function that maps each document to a certain bucket. So you can think of this, the sparse, the, the, the inverted index used here as uh, this is also hashing function. And what is hashing function here? So you have a document D. And it's basically just, um, you're just mapping to a set of uh, buckets where the, um, you have a bucket that corresponds to a certain term for all terms such that um, term is inside D. So this is your hashing function in the inverted index for sparse vectors, but your hashing function here is not as simple as that. So you have to create your own hash function and of course, you have to also have um, of, um, initialization routine where you create your buckets. How many buckets are you going to create and how you're going to create that? And that's really the, the, the core problem. And that's where everyone tries to make the innovation. And one popular but not so often used is locality sensitive hashing. So here the points that are close to each other under the chosen metric are mapped to the same bucket with high probability. So makes sense, right? So they're trying to put similar tokens into same bucket, I mean, nearby tokens. Clustering based is a bit more intuitive and also uh, simpler. So what they do is that use the k-means clustering algorithm to create predefined number of clusters and then just map each point to the closest centroid. So these two are similar but different, right? Because in the second method, you're creating the centroids, artificial points, basically. You're creating artificial points and you try to compare with these 
whereas the L stage doesn't have this entries, but they try to just optimize the objective function that try to map close points to same bucket. And in practice, this method is more um, usually preferred because clustering can be very efficiently carried out with GPUs. They are parallelizable. K-means is an iterative algorithm with parallelizable step. So um, you can, for instance, do the, um, you can build your index. You can build your inverted index like within like a few hours for billions of points if you have GPU. So, and I want to mention that this is also called, um, building this inverted index is also called a coarse quantization. I'll probably put, I'll write this well. So then you might wonder what is fine quantization? This is basically mapping, for instance, um, float 32 to float 16 into 8 etc. Or you might also try something like product quantization, which is more advanced way of quantizing things. This is uh, called scalar quantization because you're quantizing per dimension. You can also quantize per, uh, per some subspace of the vector, but I think that's out of scope for this class, but just FYI, if you're looking into the vice for your open domain project, then you might be wondering what the heck is coarse quantization and fine quantization. You might be having trouble understanding it. And coarse quantization is referring to basically building the inverted index. Another idea is creating a proximity graph. So in this case, you're trying to create a graph among the points where the, each point is vertex and you draw edge if they're close by enough. And you basically just iteratively, iteratively traverse from the query uh, until you find a close enough vertex. You can, you can, you might have a several starting points. You might start from, you know, some root, predefined root points, or you can start from um, some other points, but you're starting from a vertex in the pre-built graph and then trying to do something like, uh, you know, BFS or DFS, and then uh, you, have, you might have different uh, algorithm, search algorithm, but you're trying to find the, the most, the closest uh, vertex by iteratively increasing your search space. And the HNS of SW is one of the most popular method that's, that's using proximity graph based NNS. And one disadvantage of this is it takes up a lot of space and a lot of time to build a graph, but it's very accurate and also fast inference time, of course, not the building time. So oftentimes you use HNSW with the um, inverted index by um, you, you, if you have a lot of points, then you create um, clusters. Let's say you create five clusters and then, oh, I think the best way is to make the circle big, bigger. You make five clusters and then you just basically just allocate each point into these clusters, right? Then if you just used this um, with the inverted index, then what you do is that you just only visit one or two centroids and then just do exact search inside those centroids. But with HNSW, you can instead try to create a proximity graph among these centroids. So maybe these two are edged, these two are edged, and then like this, right? Then you can try to find the two best clusters really efficiently and then do exact search inside those clusters. So it's like second layer approximation. 
Makes sense. So because HNSW, building HNSW for a really large number of vectors is very inefficient space-wise. So you have to have a several layer, layers to actually use HNSW for a really large data set. So in practice, you'll rarely have to build your own NS algorithm because it's a very well-defined and self-contained problem. So, and there are a lot of open source algorithms, so it is more important to be able to use them correctly. Unless, of course, your, re your research specializes in this domain. So I think um, I, I have just three pointers. Um, Vice is very, very popular these days. Annoy is also used there. It's from Spotify. And scikit-learn nearest neighbor is probably not good for production or real research, but it's good for very fast um, POC or toy research, toy uh, experiments. It's very easy to use because you can just pip install and then use it right away. I think Vice also supports, and Annoy supports pip install too, but um, they're definitely more complicated, but they're more powerful. They can support like trillion, Vice can support trillions of points um, nearest neighbor search. Okay, so we're gonna have a three minute break. I'm gonna come back at 3.23 and then we're gonna spend the rest of the class on BERT recap and the large language models. See you soon.
Okay, welcome back. So I think we're not gonna spend too much time on these papers, but it's good to go through them a bit so that we understand what has happened after birds. So I think it was a few lectures ago, two or three lectures ago um, that we talked about bird and what what it was, um, what impl its implication was, and I think we all remember that BERT was a transformer encoder based architecture, and was pre trained on some language model, but it's not really language model. It's mask language model in a sense that you you have input tokens and you sometimes do you just mask it like here. I think um, yeah, they, they mask somewhere, right? They mask somewhere and then um, they mask somewhere. And then this is max. You, you have a, you know what the words are before and the after the, the mask, but you don't know what the word is on the mask and try to guess that what word is. So it's like actually close test. And then this was trained, fine-tuned on several application tasks, target tasks, and we saw that it achieved pretty high score very easily without any additional architectural or special tuning. And that was really the, the point of the paper that, okay, we have this BERT, you can use this anywhere you want just fine tune it for your application. And um, it's applicable to most discriminative tasks like tagging, classification, question answering, if it's extractive, et cetera. Even if the, it has a lot of inputs, you can just concatenate them and consider them as one, one sequence. And then there were like one or two years after BERT where we saw a lot of um, something something BERT or very similar to BERT. And these models were trying to make further improvements on top of BERT. And I think, so BERT was first introduced in 2018 and October. And I'll say like, um, this was, I think, open sourced um, something like, I do not remember really well, but then I think something like um, um, December. So by December 2018, everyone had the access to BERT. And since then, um, I think it was really fast, really uh, open source really fast, something like I think November. And then I think up to something like, um, I'll say, until GPT-3 in June, I think this is about one and a half years. We saw a lot of uh, variants of BERT and also some improvements over BERT that BERT could not do such as like generation, but the fundamental principle is quite similar. So I think uh, in this lecture and the in the uh, first few I guess a few tens of minutes of the next lecture will be about what happened since November of 2018 until GPT-3 was introduced in 2020, June 2020. So these work are usually deferred from BERT in the sense that they sometimes focus on the size and tuning. So nothing much different in the architecture the, or, or they actually propose a new pre-training task including making this into more of a generative model. And then number three is that they try to do some architectural changes. For instance, can we do Baird and Transformer? So I'm gonna just go through in a chronological order where, and then try to see which one of these fit into or which one or more fit into those papers. So first is ExcelNet, this was proposed in, um, 
June of 2019. So it's about like, I'll say seven months after BERT was open sourced. Um, so it's, and then what they proposed was they were actually focusing on the fact that BERT can be considered as the noise autoencoder, but we want to make it more like autoregressive language model and it can be more beneficial. And this is quite similar to Elmo, if you remember, right? Elmo was also a language model, but then the limitation of Elmo was that because it's an autoregressive language model, you can only consider one direction in order to, um, but then this is very critical if you're working on systems like, or working on um, problems like question answering where you have to have you have to sometimes refer to what's what's what words are after the current word you're looking at, but autoregressive model can only look at, look backward, so that's the limitation of language model or autoregressive language model, and they're they're basically differentiating between autoregressive language model as opposed to mask language model or autoencoder. So, but then they're also arguing that autoregressive language model is better than the um, denoising autoencoder, denoised autoencoder or BERT mask LM because mask LM creates um, some fake tokens in the input and its distribution is entirely different from the output distribution. So that's not good at all, they think. And also language model can have uh, um, some other benefits like it can actually generate sentence if it wants to, unlike BERT. So how can we then get the, the best of both wor worlds, which is that AR has, um, it's, it's good because AR language model has, <clears throat> um, it's, it's language model, it's typical language model, but then the mask language model has the bi-directional property. So in order to take the best of the both, both worlds, what they did was they actually permute the language modeling objective so that basically um, I'll not go into details but basically they permute which means they mix the tokens and try to you know get the correct order of the tokens you can think of like that and another contribution they made was that instead of using transformer they use transformer excel which is kind of improved version of transformer that's able to handle really long sequence by using relative position encoding. So your encoding of position is not absolute, but it's relative to others when you're computing the attention. And there is also something called segment recurrence mechanism that they segment long text and then trying to create some recurrence, uh, recurrence relationship between these segments so that you can, even if you have really long sequence, you don't have to just chunk it, but you can create a recurrent relationship between those. So how was it? Let's look at the results. So I'll skip the details. Here you go. So they were arguing that for instance, the race data set, then there's a actually squad and other data sets, right? So they're comparing against BERT and they were scanning like um, how much like here um, on 1.5, 1.2, they were getting about, in two, squad 2.0, they were getting 2.3 and 2.3, and they were getting 2.3, and they were getting 1.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.4, a lot of difference here, 7.2, 0 0.4, 1.3, 1 1.5 and 0.9. So they were saying, oh, if we do this way in an apple to apple comparison, we are doing better than BERT. 
there was very simple story of the paper. And now you will see there is a section called comparison with Roberta. And I'll actually get back to this, why they did this. Um, but uh, this was actually added later. So if you look at this paper, this was actually um, submitted to Europe's and also published there. And it is actually conjecture that um, they submitted this in June, right? And they have updated this once um, after probably publishing at uh, Europe's. And it's likely that the reviewers were asking comparison with existing, I mean, some work that has been published pretty recently. And that work is exactly Roberta, which was published, I mean, released one month after this. So let's get back to that. Um, so it's 2019, July. So Roberta was different from ExcelNet in the sense that, so actually before that, so ExcelNet, as you saw, um, were contributing towards probably these two, right? Because they changed the architecture to Transformer Excel. And they also changed the pre-training task to some combinatorical permutation problem. They didn't really care much about, I think, size or tuning. And then in Roberta, what was amazing was that um, Roberta has exactly the same architecture as BERT. So weights are interchangeable because the architecture has no difference. But they, what, what they argue is that BERT was under-trained significantly. And they had to train BERT longer. They, could, they trained BERT longer and it was working better. And they removed some of the training objectives which was next sentence prediction, which is not used anymore. They trained on longer sequences. They dynamically changed the masking patterns during training. In BERT, I don't know why, but the masks are prefixed. They have several epochs on the same um, training data, but then mask is always the same. So I'm not sure why they did that initially. Maybe they were running out of time, the BERT authors were. But this is a more apparent thing to do. And more training, of course. And what they're saying is that these alone can achieve better accuracy than ExcelNet. So now you see what the issue was because they submit this to Europe's and then one month later, which is probably before the reviewers were seeing the paper, they said that Here we go. So this is the core results. And then they see that their best is probably, um, it's probably not this one. It's this one, yeah, sorry about that. This is main results. And then they were saying that um, if you just put everything together, it's these numbers. And if you compare this with BERT, it has a lot of difference, right? And even compared to ExcelNet, you have difference of SST2, uh, 1.8, I uh, know, 0.8, and here 0.4, and here 0.6. So it's not too much difference, but Considering that ExcelNet was, the main point of ExcelNet was that they had to use Tech Transform Excel. They had to use this permutation thing to work this better. Roberta was basically, no, it's not true. What you are doing is all doable with BERT if you just train longer with a bit smarter training scheme. And they do this further on other data sets, classification task. And they, again, compared to ExcelNet, they actually achieve higher accuracies in every, almost every task, right? Uh, there are a few tasks that ExcelNet was better, like um, SST and MRPC, but um, this difference is only small, like 0.1, and this is 0.7, right? So, and here, 
a bit larger than 1.4. So in general, it's hard to say that XLNet is better than Roberta, especially given that BERT was, was using simpler architecture than XLNet. So that, they, that's why they actually, um, XLNet paper wrote this comparison, most likely because reviewers asked, okay, but there is a, this recent paper in July that um, can you compare with them? And probably they were trying to say that ours is, uh, XLNet is better. So I don't know. I'm not sure which one is better yet. Um, but then looks like excellent paper was trying to uh, come up with one reason that they were better than um, Roberta after Roberta kind of um, attacked XLNet uh, motivation. Okay, so last paper we're gonna look through is BART. So BART is a bit different from the previous two papers in that um, this is sequence to sequence pre-training. So instead of using just the encoder side, it's using the entire transformer. And it's still denoising auto encoder sense that, so it's unlike XLNet in a sense that um, the text is corrupted with an arbitrary noising function, not uh, just masking. So, but then it's also different from BERT in that the crack output is generated via transformer decoder. And one interesting thing is that they do this as a training objective, but then the point is that BART can be um, just encoder side of BART can be used just to replace BERT and encoder decoder can be used together to for uh, some sequence to sequence task. So let's look at the paper. So this was actually October. So this is about three months after Roberta. So this is how they do it. So you can think of this as a comparison between BERT and BART. So in BERT, you corrupt um, some token and then try to guess what that is. And they also talk about GPT, which is just autoregressive decoder. They just try to produce the next word given the previous words. But in BART, the input is similar to the BERT, right? But difference is that instead of trying to generate just the masked parts of the, um, the input, they try to generate the entire thing with the autoregressive decoder. So they, in this way, they're, they're, they can use the exactly the same training data from BERT, but they can make this into sick to sick pre-training mechanism. And BART is actually, um, so in a sense that it can be sick to sick is a good thing. And they were arguing that compared to BERT, but not other um, pre-trained models though, but compared to BERT, they were saying that um, they can do better or at least similar to most tasks. Um, for instance, squat 1.1, they were getting better number than BERT, but this is, note that this is base, so it's not large. So there are two sizes, right? So, but the main point was that they're trying to do this in a six to six setup, right? So that's why actually they do this in summarization. These two are summarization data. So now people are starting to um, look into different ways to use BERT-like pre-trained models. And they, they now can, they, they could do classification with BERT. So what BART wanted to do is they want to also do sick to sick tasks like summarization or some conversational model, some conversational tasks like here. And they were saying that if you do that, you can easily obtain state of the art with very large margin. So here, even using some BERT that's tuned for generation, they were getting like 6% difference, right? So it's a lot of difference actually in generation. This is 6%. So you can think of BART as being very appropriate for um, sick to sick pre-trained model. And I think it's one of, uh, uh, in, at least in English, it's one of um, um, something that still people use if you want to do some sick to sick, like summarization. Uh, as a backbone 
or sometimes T5 that we're gonna discuss in the next lecture. But um, it's worth noting that I think still um, multilingual BART or multilingual trans T5, like these models are not super working well compared to BERT. BERT, multilingual BERT is pretty good. It works pretty well. Um, although if you're working on Korean, it's better to use the Korean, Korean BERT such as COBERT, SKT created. So I think that's all for BART. I think we'll end the class a bit earlier today. Um, so we're gonna look into, so I think in today's class, we look into papers up to late 2019. In the next class, we'll actually be go through a bit about GPT-2, which was actually earlier than these papers. And then we'll see kind of the next phase of um, the, the pre-trained language model, which is so things like T5, which was released in, I think, December 2019, up to 2020, June 2020, until when GPT was released. So a few more papers will be uh, will be covering next week, and maybe also GPT-3. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll see you on Wednesday.